So we're talking about sanctification of the Spirit. Uh, can anybody remember what the word sanctification means? It's a process of what? Setting apart. Pardon? Setting apart. Setting apart, becoming more like Christ, more holy. Um, this is the definition um, from Wayne Grudem's uh, theological uh, systematic theology, a a progressive work of God and man that makes us more and more free from sin and more like Christ in our actual lives. And I would add the word holiness to that because that's a word that's commonly used. We should be increasing in our holiness, which means our separation from the world, from sin. And it's a process that God is taking us through. And I wanted to remind us of the fact that this process is carried out under the umbrella of the no condemnation. You know, in in sanctification, sanctification, as we're going to learn and study here, we're going to see that sanctification is something that we participate in and God expects of us to work at. And yet we can be driven into sort of a legalistic sense about that. And we can feel guilty if we're not making as much progress as we think we ought to make and so forth. And so I want to remind us that, uh, that God has forgiven us and remove the condemnation from us. There's no condemnation, as Romans 8, 1 tells us. At the conference I went to a couple of weeks ago, I was, somebody brought this up, and I had never thought about this before. Um, in, in the book of Exodus, God gave the Ten Commandments. That's law. But the Ten Commandments came after the Exodus. In other words, God did not say, you know, thou shalt have no other gods before me, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder, and all these things. Now, if you guys will keep all those, I'm going to take you out of the bondage. He took, us, he took them out of the bondage first. And then he said, now you are free, I freed you as a people, now be the people I want, now be the kind of people I want you to be. So it's under that grace, that umbrella. And then another example of that is in John 8, 11. Remember the woman that was taken in adultery? And Jesus said to her, um, go and sin no more. That was a commandment. But that came after Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. So she was given the grace first. And that's, that to me is an important lesson. He's given, he's given us the grace first, the umbrella first. Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins the sins are gone, buried in the depths of the sea, removed from the, as far as the east is from the west. Now he says, with that, with that umbrella of no condemnation, now you and I, God and us, are going to work at this process of becoming more holy. But if you, don't, if you fail at it, which we all will, there's no such thing as, as perfection in this life. As we fail in that effort, that's all forgiven. God never looks at us with, with a whip and a scowl and says, you know, how come you guys are so slow at this? Um, because we've been forgiven. Last week we looked, worked through this section, and um, I wanted to apologize for the muddle we got ourselves into toward the end of this last week. Um, I think Donita had a really, really, really good point. She asked us, we were talking about God's drawing, and we started wondering, well, if God draws me, what about them? It also reminds me, I remember when when uh, was... Jesus was talking to Peter, and, and he said, well, what about, what about John back over here? And what did Jesus tell Peter? Don't worry about him. Just you take care of you. Um, but my point in this whole lesson, that, that's a good discussion to have, and we've had it sometimes in this class. But our, our focus now is on what, what God is doing in our lives as individuals and the fact that God, whether God calls everybody or God calls some, or God draws everybody or God draws some, the point is if you're a believer, he's drawn you. So we need to focus on that part of it. And God has an individual love for us. I was thinking, we, I heard the president yesterday, Dennis was there, listening to the president of the United States. Outside in the cold, using a jumbotron. You didn't even get to shake his hand. No. Did you see the motorcade or anything? Let me use an example from what he said. The president said in one of his, he said things like this a lot. We love our farmers. Okay? Sometimes he'll say, we love our factory workers. Now, 
if I go up to an individual farmer around here and tell him that the president loves him as a farmer, does the president really love him? I mean, him personally, you know, John Smith, whatever his name is, and appreciates the work that he does on his field and his farm. He's, he's saying, I love, the, I love the farmers. We as Americans love the farmers, but it's, it's a generic category. That's not the way it is with God. When God says in John 3.16, for God so loved the world, it's not like President Trump saying we love the farmers. When God says he loves the world, he's talking about all the individuals in the world, and God is capable of loving every person in the world individually and working and and developing each one individually as he chooses, as he, as he wants to work. He can work any way he wants to. So what I want us to do is focus on uh, that this is a message for you and me. God loves you individually and personally. Um, he has you in mind. There's a verse in um, Jeremiah. I was going to put it on the screen and I didn't do it. But there's a verse in Jeremiah where God says... Um, Yea, I have loved you. This is one of my memory verses on one of my cards. Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. And the point I want to make from that verse is, is not why did he draw Jeremiah and not somebody else or whatever. I'm not worried about all that right now. I'm worried about the fact, concerned about the fact that God wants us to know that he loves us personally. Your name is associated with it. God loves you individually. And therefore, he is designing, verse Romans 8, 28, God works all things together for good. It's not just kind of a generic working things to good. He's got my name on, on something he's working on. And so he allows this event or that event to happen to me personally so that Roger will, will become more sanctified. And the same thing for you. He's got your name on his work in your life. It's all personal. And I want you to, to grab a hold of that because that's the thing that's important in all of this. So that's where we're, that's what we're talking about. So now sanctification. Sanctification, when does it begin? As soon as you're saved, right. The Bible describes every believer as being sanctified. Let's look at Acts 20:32. 20, there's one sense in which he sanctifies us completely. Now there's another sense in which he's working on it. And um, but this applies to every Every believer. Acts 20, verse 32. Paul, or yeah, Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders. He says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Now, when he says he's able to make, give you inheritance among all those who are sanctified, who is he talking about when he says among all those who are sanctified? Who is he talking about? Believers. All believers. He's calling all believers people that are being sanctified. So God describes every believer as being sanctified. It starts at the beginning when you're saved. He starts sanctifying you. Titus 3.5. Now, it doesn't use the word sanctification here, but it's the same concept. Titus 3.5. Titus 3.5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Okay, so how did he do that? Through the washing of regeneration. That's the new birth. The washing of regeneration. And the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's your sanctification. So how does God save us? He saves us with the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. And he's saying that's true of everyone. There are some churches that teach that sanctification is a completely separate process. They teach there's like a second blessing. Have you heard of that concept before? In fact, I was talking to, actually both of my sons-in-law were raised in the kind of a church as, as children where they taught that. They taught you could be saved at one point, but then at some other point, you needed to be sanctified. And after that, you were pretty much perfect. They believe in, in a, almost a sinless perfection. But now I read that they don't really mean perfectly sinless. They just mean known sins. They don't mean all the ways we kind of cheat God on out of time and love of him and everything. They just mean purposely overt sins they, they think you can be free from. But I don't know about you, 
But there are times when I sin overtly. I know I shouldn't respond in a certain way, and I do it anyway. And then there goes every oh, there goes the whole thing out the window. And those people believe that you can lose your salvation every time that happens. So you're constantly, you know, going back and forth on that. So um, I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. Sanctification comes along with salvation. First Corinthians six eleven. <laughs> First Corinthians six eleven. I'm going to write this stuff all out for you to give you the notes here at some point. This is after Paul lists a whole bunch of sins of people that won't inherit the kingdom of God, and he says in verse eleven, "Such were some of you." I like the word "were." Such were some of you, but you were washed. That's your being born again, you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So he's describing all those people at Corinth. He says, you're not, this, you're not the way you were anymore because you've all been sanctified and are being sanctified. So my point is that in the Bible, all Christians are going through the sanctification process. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Where do we, where do we, let me stop right there. Where do we behold the glory of the Lord in a mirror? Where? In God's word. Okay. So we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. Into the same image. What image is that? The image of Christ. We all are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. That's the Spirit's primary job is the sanctification. So who who does he include here? But we all, with unveiled face, we're beholding Christ in the Scriptures. And as we do that, we are being transformed. So if you spend time in the Word today, which you will because you're here looking at the Scriptures and hearing messages today, as you look at Christ in the Word, you are being transformed. You are, you are, it's, it is happening to you. I've told you the story about Rosaria Butterfield. I think we even saw her on a video a while back. Uh, she used to be a lesbian. Now she's um, a saved person and a pastor's wife and a, and a Christian speaker. But when she was, she was studying the Bible in order to basically condemn it in some of her writings before she was saved, and the person she was living with said, you know, I'm worried about you because you are changing. She wasn't even a Christian yet, but she was changing. And so the, the scripture changes us. If you, want to know, if you want to speed up the sanctification, if there is such a thing as speeding it up, speeding it up can be improved by doing what? Spending more time in the Word, meditating upon it, and growing. Sanctification is not an optional stage of the Christian life. It's a core part of it. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4.3. You're going to get your finger worked out today. 1 Thessalonians 4.3. There's an awful lot of people, even in our kind of churches, that believe not like the second blessing kind of thing, but they actually believe that sanctification is optional. I've come to Christ, so I'm safe. I'm safe. I don't have hell in my future. But you know what? I don't care too much about growing in the faith. It's optional. And a lot of people believe that. And the scripture doesn't teach that. It is not optional. It's part of the Christian life. In um, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, he says, um, this is the will of God, your sanctification. And then he continues the verse with a specific area that you should abstain from sexual immorality. But sanctification is the will of God for every believer. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness 
What is the pursuit of holiness? Pursuit of holiness is sanctification. So pursue peace and holiness. Now notice what the rest of the verse says. Without which no one sees the Lord. You don't see the Lord without holiness. Now he's not talking here, I don't think. I'll give you an opinion. This is my opinion. I don't think he's talking about positional holiness, justification by God holiness. When God, when God saves us, he declares us holy and righteous. There's no condemnation. I don't think he's saying that because he's talking to Christians. And secondly, pursuing holiness that way is not something you do. You don't pursue it. You trust Christ and you've got holiness. So he's talking here, I believe, about pursuing practical holiness. Now he says, without holiness, you won't see the Lord. Well, how holy do you have to be in your actual living to see the Lord? Well, you can't be perfectly holy because the perfectly holy in this life doesn't exist. We're declared holy, so remember we got that umbrella, and under that umbrella of holiness, we're supposed to pursue holiness. And so there should be some holiness in our life growing in order to see God. That's, a, that's part of the Christian life. It happens because God is at work to make that happen. Now, a thief on the cross, how much holiness could he develop in his life before he was with Christ that day in paradise? He didn't have a whole lot of time to work on that, right? Because he, was, he accepted Christ and then he died, the thief on the cross. But people that live normally, you know, if you're not accepting Christ on your deathbed, you're accepting Christ before that, then there should be a pursuit of holiness going on along the way. So it's not an optional thing. It's part of, it's part of the Christian life. The new birth... This is something you hear, you hear me talk about a lot, and it's very, very important. The new birth has changed our inner affections. If you look, we're not going to turn here because we've done this a lot. Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27 is the promise in the Old Testament of the new covenant. In the new covenant, God promises that our old heart will be removed. We will receive a new heart. We will have a new living spirit. We will have the Holy Spirit. And our motivations will be changed. He says, I will cause you. That the words he uses in, the, in Ezekiel, he says, God says, I will cause you to walk in my ways. What was the problem with the old covenant? It could not be kept. You know, the old covenant, all those commandments. It cannot be done. It God says, you do all this and you'll live. It can't be done. That's the whole purpose of, one of the big purposes of the Old Testament, is to show how hard it is to do the right thing and how much failure we have in our lives. So the new covenant says, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take out your old heart. I'm going to give you a new heart, a new spirit, my spirit. I'm going to change your motivations completely. Your whole inner workings of your, of your motivational clock or whatever it is, your directional, your compass or whatever, changes. When God saves you, when you trust Christ as your Savior, he comes in, he changes you so that your motivations, your desires, everything about you changes. Um, Paul writes, even in the struggle that he has in Romans 7, you're familiar with that, right? He says, I want to do the things of God, and then what? Everything I want to do, I end up not doing. And the things I don't want to do, I do. And the things I really don't want to do, I keep doing. So that's a big struggle. But he says what? I delight in the law of God, in the inner man. That's not like what a lot of people that we know uh, who say, you know, I just can't, I can't live the Christian life. Well, what about your love of the scripture? I don't really care about the scripture. I don't love God. I don't, you know. I, well, Paul had a struggle. Yes, we have a struggle. But there's a delight inside in the law of God. When we delight in something, what does that mean? You really like it. Do you have a hard time staying away from the things you delight in? If you delight in something, do you move toward it? Or do you just kind of say, I really, really, really like that, but you know what? I'm going to skip that today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. Things you delight in, you usually find time for. You know, that's, that's the way we are. Um, and so there's a delight that God has given 2 Corinthians 5.17, I don't think we need to turn there. You know that one, right? Therefore, somebody help me. 
If any man is what? A new creature, a new creation. And it doesn't stop there. Old things are passed away, and behold, a few of the things have become new. Almost all. Almost all. What does it say? All. all. Is that, haven't you in your life found that hard to believe? <clears throat> Looking at your own self. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When you look at your own life, doesn't that seem hard to believe? Yes. yes. You should say yes. <laughs> because whenever I would do good, sin is there. So it doesn't feel like all is new. But God says it is. Because he has completely changed and rearranged your internal compass. The power of sin has been broken. We've had lessons on this particularly, but here we're just kind of doing it in passing. When God saves us, and saves anybody, he breaks the power. You know the song? I don't know if I made a note to myself here. We sing a song that has a line that goes like this. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. But that first line is a, an important one. It's not scripture, but it's, it comes from the scripture. He breaks the power of canceled sin. Now, why does the author of that hymn say that? Can't, what is canceled sin? Sin that's been put away and forgiven. So the sin has been canceled. Remember the song we used to sing in Sunday school a long time ago? Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Okay, we... It's true, they're gone. Sin, is, sin has been paid for. And that author of that song says, the sin has been canceled, and he breaks the power of that canceled sin. So as much as you feel like sin has got an awful lot of power in your life, the truth from God is, it has no power over you. So in Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, I need to get there somewhere here. Romans 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the power of sin might be, what does the older King James say? Destroyed. Destroyed. The newer one says done away with. It means made ineffective made ineffective so the power of sin knowing this your old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with might be destroyed might be cancelled so that has been broken and when you feel like when you say to yourself sin sometimes has so much power over me you are telling yourself a lie it has no power over you because God has broken that power Verse 7, for he who has died, and he's talking about us, not Christ. We, we've died with Christ. For he who has died has been what? Freed, freed from, sin. from sin. We are freed from sin. Now, what is this is chapter 6. In chapter 7, Paul says, I'm free from sin, but every time I want to do the right thing, sin is there. So sin has got a, a stronghold, but it has no power over you. And victory starts to come when you actually believe this. And usually what we do is we believe a lie instead. And verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God. We need to reckon it. Not, that doesn't, that's not telling ourselves a lie. Reckon it yourself dead to sin. It's something, you are believing the truth. You're counting it as true. God says it's true, so you're living that way. You're, you're counting it to be true. So sanctification in its beginning, all these things are true of us. That's God setting the stage for our continued growth. Let's look at the last verse, 1 John 3. 1 John 3, beginning in verse 6. <clears throat> Whoever abides in him does not sin. Now, that's pretty convicting. So I have to give you a little Greek lesson. If it means exactly what it says in English, whoever abides in him does not sin. We are all in deep trouble. Right? Because I don't know that there's any of us who don't sin. 
the Greek word for does not sin has written into it, the Greeks would understand this, and hard, it's hard to translate it into English. Um, some translations talk about practicing, re- re- repeating, repeatedly. So it has the word of, you could do it like this, whoever abides in him does not continually practice sinning. It's not a way of life with a pers- in a person who is born again. So whoever abides in him does not continually practice sin. Why is that? It's because the power of sin has been broken. So whoever abides in him does not continually sin. Whoever continually practices sinning has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices... Now there he changed it. See how he, the, the, this, My translation puts practices in here. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who practices sinning is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not continue to practice sinning, for his, God's, seed remains in him, and he cannot continually practice sinning because he's been born of God. That's what the new birth is. It stops that cycle of continually, continually sinning. Um, verse 10, in this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. What does manifest mean? Made known, made obvious. In this the children of God and the children of the devil are made manifest, made obvious. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So the new birth is something that, that has changed our inner workings completely. Okay? It's a, it's not, I, I use this example a lot. It's not like talking somebody into being a Republican who used to be a Democrat, or vice versa. It's not just like a mental thing, you know. Baptists sound good. I used to be Catholic, now I'm going to be a Baptist. Somebody talked me into that. Um, it's, that's not what salvation is. Salvation, when we trust Christ as our Savior, he completely renovates our inside and changes everything about us. So what have we learned so far? God starts it. It's initiated by him. It involves a total reorientation of the will and affections. And the power of sin has been broken. What if someone slips back, such as a backslidden or a carnal Christian? Let's look at Proverbs 14, 14. The word backslidden is not in the New Testament at all. So that should tell you something. Most of the places in the Old Testament where it talks about backsliding, it talks about Israel. Why, O Israel, have you backslidden? This verse, I think, helps us to get at what God's idea of backsliding is in the Old Testament. Proverbs 14, 14. The backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied from above. What kind of a distinction is he making in those two parts of that verse? The backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways. The good man, on the other hand, will be satisfied from God, from above. What kind of a distinction is he making between those two? Tom? It sounds like a believer and an unbeliever, doesn't it? The backsliding person is filled with his own ways. On the other hand, a good person, he's comparing backslidden and good, for one thing. A backslidden person is filled with his own ways. A good person, on the other hand, is satisfied from above. But doesn't the term backslider imply someone that was once a certain way and is going back to his old ways? It does in English, but the, the Bible isn't using it that way. I mean, the, the, there's no use of it at all in the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, it's always with Israel, not with individual people. And then this one verse, he's talking about an individual, and he's saying a backslider, what he's calling a backslider in the Bible's definition, apparently. It sounds to us like we've learned to use it a different way. But God's using it of a person who maybe was a professing person, but they're filled with themselves. They're filled with their own ways, their own wants. But a good person, on the other hand, is somebody who's satisfied from above. Um, what about a carnal Christian? Let's turn to 1 Corinthians. I think what we'll do is we'll start with... 
the chapter 3 part, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4. And, and I, brethren, this is Paul writing, 1 Corinthians 3, beginning at verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, or spiritual men, whatever, as unto spiritual, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. So, so far we know that a carnal person is what? A babe in Christ. Okay. I fed you with milk and not with meat or solid food. Just like a baby. For until now, you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal. By the way, the word carnal means fleshly. Fleshly. The, it, it, you know, carnal, have you ever heard of the, the, the chili? <laughs> what are you talking about? Chili in the grocery store. The can says, chili con carne. You know what I mean? What does that mean, chili con carne? Chili with meat, flesh. That's what the, the Spanish has the same carnal, the same word. So you are still carnal. Um, for where there is envy, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like what? Like men, like people, like unsaved people. So we got two definitions. A carnal person is a baby in Christ, and a carnal person in, is acting in that particular way as though they were still an unsafe person, just a normal, aren't you just acting like normal people act? Um, so that's the definition there. And he says, um, he says, verse 4, when, I am one, when one says, I am a Paul, and another, I am a Paulus, are you not carnal? Are you not acting like men? That's kind of what he's saying. Now, let's go back to chapter 1. By the way, all the words you in that chapter, I thought about this in the middle of the night. So I looked it up. He says, are you not carnal? He's talking to the group. It's, it's all plural. In English, we say you, and you don't know whether I'm talking about a lot of, unless you're from the South, you might go y'all, and then it's a lot of people. But in English, normally, we would say, you know, I'm writing this letter to you. We don't know whether it's to a whole group of people or it's to that person, individual. But here, that's, he's, in the original language, he's using the plural. I'm, you guys are carnal, you all, in, in Corinth. All right, let's go back to the chapter 1, verse 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Okay, now he's talking to these people. Are these the same people we just read about? The carnal ones. Yes. To the church of, and you know, before I, let me interrupt myself, you know, if you know the rest of Corinth, there were a lot of other problems besides being a Paul and Apollos. We had people in the church committing adultery and nobody was doing anything about it. It was a messy church. And then people wanted the gifts. They wanted the best gifts. They wanted to be speaking in tongues and doing all kinds of stuff to be, try to gain a lot of support. So it, there was a lot of stuff going on. So he says to them, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus... So we know they're sanctified, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. And jump down to verse 4. He says, grace and peace to you. Verse 4, I thank my God always concerning y'all for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. So he's thanking God for the grace that they have, that you were enriched in everything by him, Okay, now what does he mean by that? You were enriched, y'all were enriched were with, in everything, in all utterance and in all knowledge. So what does that mean? That means their speech and their knowledge of Christ has been enriched by the grace of God in their lives. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so there's some testimony of God was confirmed in these people, so that you come short in no gift. So they have the gifts of the Spirit. Eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So these people are looking forward to Christ coming. Who will also confirm you to the end. God, Christ is going to hold them to the end. 
that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, when you think, when you think of, in our, in our kind of vocabulary that we've adopted as Christians, we've adopted the, the vocabulary of carnal Christian. I don't want you to think of any particular person. I want you to just to think of what kind of a person do you picture when you picture, you might say to yourself, even if it was judgmental, you might say, that person is just carnal. Would you say that that person that you are imagining has been enriched in everything in him and that their speech and their knowledge has been enriched by God in such a way that the testimony of Christ was confirmed in them, they had the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and that they were waiting eagerly for the revelation of Jesus Christ. Is that the person that you picture when you picture there's a carnal Christian? No. We picture a carnal Christian as a person who almost exclusively lives like, a, like the world. Now, these people were living like babies and like mere men, but that was only in areas. You see, the area he's talking about in, in chapter 3 is they were picking sides. They were in church. They were faithful in church. They were just saying, you know what? I'm following after Paul. And somebody says, oh, I don't follow Paul so much. I follow Paulus. And then the holier than thou one says, we don't follow any of those guys. We follow Christ. We're the holy ones. Because we're following, you guys are off the track when you're following Paul and Apollos. So in each case, there are, there are things wrong with them, definitely wrong with them, but they are not overall like men. They're like acting like normal people, plain unborn again people in certain areas. And that has not negated the fact that God has demonstrated his grace in them, in their speech and in their love for God, in their desire to do the right thing and to have gifts of the Spirit and looking for the coming of Christ. So that's what a carnal Christian is. The invention that we've made, I, I'm going to give you my opinion, is that we have made a big mistake by, by applying the idea of a carnal Christian and making, that, making up that category. It gives people the assurance that, 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 that there are three categories of people. I can be a lost person, which I don't want to be. I can be a saved person, but I don't have to go any farther than that. I can trust Christ, but I don't need any of this sanctification stuff. I can just be saved. And I don't have to grow. I don't have to act like a Christian in any area. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to love the scripture. I don't have to do any of that. I can just be saved. I'll just be a carnal Christian. And then I got my fire insurance. Or some people want to be like spiritual. So then that's, if that's what they like, then they can do that. It makes it seem like there are three categories of people. And I think in the Bible, there's only two categories of people. There's lost people and saved people. And all saved people are not perfect. No, no saved people are perfect. And everybody's struggling with something. And some are, act like men and, you know, like plain ordinary people in some ways. And in other ways, they're spiritually acting. So that's my opinion as to how it is. But I think we have to be careful sometimes of the jargon we pick up and we create for ourselves, you know, because I think some of it's not maybe as biblical as we'd hoped it would be. Um, we'll pick up from there next time. Any questions, thoughts? The, the, challenge, the challenge for our own individual lives is um, make sure you're in the faith, number one. Make sure that this change has occurred in your life, that God has actually changed something and that you're not just professing Christ. Because professing Christ is easy in some ways. You know, Jesus said, Jesus said not everybody that says to be Lord, Lord is getting in. Just because just you do all the right things, attend church, have your Bible, and do all that. Um, it's those, those who actually do what I say and follow through with it from the internal change of the heart that actually are the ones who are saved. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We pray that you would help us as we learn to apply it. And we thank you. I'm thankful today for the, the personal aspect of your work in our lives. We've kind of caused, coined the phrase, accepting you as our personal savior, even though that's not in the scripture. You, you're our personal savior. You love us individually as individual people, and you have time and you listen to our prayers and you are at work 
orchestrating events and circumstances for our greatest amount of growth. And we thank you for that. We pray that you help us to be able to trust you with that. Be with the next service. We pray for Pastor as he ministers your word this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.